Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to week three of the Resource Insider Podcast, quarantined edition. I am not officially quarantined anymore, but since basically all of Vancouver is shut down, there's nowhere to go anyway, so I'm sitting at home and continuing to do these podcasts with some very excellent guests that we've been able to get because they're trapped at home too and they don't have anything to do besides talk to me. So it's a great opportunity for me and for my listeners. And today is no exception for that. We're sitting down with none other than David Garofalo. He is now the chairman and chief executive officer of the Marshall Precious Metals Fund, but that's probably not where you know him from. You probably know him as the past president and CEO and director of Gold Corp the president and CEO of Hud Bay Minerals, and maybe some of you even know before that he was the CFO of Agnico Eagle. So some of the biggest and most successful gold miners in the world today. David has got a very interesting perspective on the challenges that it takes to run a producing international mining company and what, what they're going to be facing today in a world where a lot of things are getting shut down and we're facing a lot of challenges. So David, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. And thanks for having right. me on and I wish everybody good health. So let's, um, let's start from the beginning. Uh, can you give people the 30,000 foot view of, of what you're doing today and a little bit about your background? Well, uh, today, uh, along with my partner, Mark Prefontaine, and our Chinese partners, Saojin Mining, have launched a precious metal investment fund focused on early stage exploration in the gold space. Uh, prior to that, uh, I ran Gold Corp uh, for about three and a half years prior to our merger with Newmont. I uh, spent nearly six years running Hud Bay during a, a very rapid construction phase of three new mines. And before that, I spent 12 years at Ignico. And before that, eight years at, at Inmet, but the 12 years at Ignico probably defined my career most, more, more, more than most just because we went through a rapid construction phase there with about six mines in development. So uh, my career has been on the mine development side, but recognizing that uh, we need juniors to find uh, good deposits for us to build. So you have transitioned uh, to, well, you know, you've transitioned after the sale of Gold Corp or the merger of Gold Corp rather. Newmont, which is a $10 billion merger, which we'll get into in a bit. But now you're running a fund focused on gold and precious metals exploration. You know, what made you transition from running big, major mining companies to looking at exploration projects, to looking for new assets this way? Well, part of it is a passion project um, in virtually every company that I've operated in, uh, whether it's uh, Gold Corp, Hud Bay, or Ignico, we actually ran incubator funds within those larger vehicles, essentially outsourcing our exploration, recognizing that juniors really did the best prospecting. Uh, they had the right risk tolerance, uh, right entrepreneurial mindset to do that. And so rather than bring that in house, we allowed that grassroots exploration to be done uh, within existing vehicles run by very capable entrepreneurs uh, that were good prospectors. So I'm essentially extending that um, on a full-time basis on the buy side, uh, recognizing that uh, behind the scenes, the dynamic in the gold sector right now is uh, this, the industry really hasn't, hasn't been reinvesting back into exploration in any meaningful way. And as a result, we've seen over the last seven or eight years, a 50% decline in gold reserves, uh, primarily driven through depletion. Um, and so it's going to become an existential imperative for the sector for juniors to be successful in prospecting for new deposits. So Rick Rule talks about this extensively, that we haven't seen a proper exploration bull market in well over a decade. And I think he even talked about the last bull market wasn't really a true exploration market, but you were seeing known assets be repriced and repackaged and traded around. But for companies to go out and do grassroots exploration, look for new assets, or perhaps redevelop uh, unloved and unforgotten projects that are potentially economic in today's gold or, or, or metals prices. What, you know, what is your strategy going forward on this? And perhaps you could also talk about who's backing this fund, because I think that's a very interesting element to this as well. Yeah, certainly our strategy is to do direct placements into these early stage exploration juniors. 
uh, that have uh, good management teams with a proven track record and prospecting successful exploration and putting the money directly into the ground. So we're not looking to buy the stock in the market. We want to uh, fund catalyst rich exploration programs run by capable management teams. And we think inevitably the capital will start to cycle back into these companies. They have not participated in the gold price rally that we've enjoyed in the gold industry over the last couple of years. The juniors have lagged significantly in past cycles. They've participated. In fact, uh, they cut off and outperformed uh, the established producers uh, as the cycle picked up. So we haven't seen that yet. And then there are probably a couple of dynamics behind that. Um, you know, we, we've seen a focus for shareholders on uh, returning capital, free cash flow. So producers have been necessarily focused on optimizing their margins as opposed to replacing the ounces they're depleting uh, from the ground. And so they have not reinvested back in exploration, but inevitably that'll come to roost. They're going to have to invest back um, into the juniors uh, in terms of buying those deposits, hopefully that the juniors are finding. So we're anticipating that cycling of capital uh, back into the juniors and we're going to start to invest in what we think are the, the most prospective uh, opportunities we see in the junior space with good management teams. And you asked about who our backers are. Well, um, last year I was working with Zhao Jin um, on a consulting basis on a couple of M&A files. Uh, their new head of overseas business development is an old friend of mine, an ex-investment uh, banker based in Hong Kong. He asked me to help him on, on a couple of the files. And Zhao Jin found it very difficult to participate in auction processes for non-core assets that were being sold by some of the producers, simply because the stigma around uh, Chinese SOEs is they can't complete deals, they can't close. Um, Zhao Jin happens to be a a provincially owned SOE as such, they can keep their capital offshore. So their brand just isn't well known, known enough uh, among the established producers in North America for them to be taken seriously. So it's part of a holistic approach to get their brand out there so they can participate in buying um, overseas assets and start to diversify outside of the domestic production. They've decided to set up this incubator fund and start to put capital work with juniors. Um, doing that, um, they've, they've segregated this fund entirely. Um, it's, it's under the control of myself and Mark Prefontaine and one other external investor. Uh, and so Zhao Jin's asked us to run this like any other fund would be run uh, for capital appreciation. Um, they have no preemptive rights in anything we invest in, but what they will do is one, seed us with capital, but also lend us technical expertise when we need it to evaluate opportunities. And so they have a very well-established operating team in Shandong province and a business that produces about a million ounces a year. So they have a very deep bench that we can draw upon as we evaluate opportunities to invest in for the fund. Now, do you guys have a, and I'm kind of asking for my own curiosity on this one. Do you have a maximum size of a company you can invest in? Can you invest in a company that's in a development stage? Uh, can you invest in something that already has an established resource or is this, purely sort of grassroots pre-resource. Is, is there a sweet spot there? Um, I, I think we'll look across the spectrum from even pre-drill, um, pre-resource, to ones that are close to development. Um, so development stage assets, I'd say we'll probably be, you know, and this is rather academic at this point because we're just starting to deploy capital. I'd say probably 75% focused on the exploration stage uh, from pre-drill to things with a resource and maybe 25% resource stage. Uh, you know, if you look at the classic Lasan curve in terms of when mm -hmm. share prices really appreciate, it's at the discovery phase and it's at the pre-development phase or development phase when you start to see the share prices start to uh, reflect the underlying value of the assets. And so we want to make sure we allocate capital accordingly. I I'd say our sweet spot in terms of size is anywhere from micro cap to 150 to $200 million market cap. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to have... Um, uh, significant influence. Uh, we can be uh, the, the uh, primary order within a syndicate. We can be the sole source of capital for relatively early stage opportunity if we really, really believe on the prospect. Um, so I think we'll be quite flexible in that regard. But I think the important element is we're trying to put money into the ground. Uh, we're trying yeah. to uh, catalyze exploration, which has been uh, lacking in the sector for quite a few years because of the relentless bear market as you pointed out, the juniors have been experiencing for a number of years. So you're really a discovery-focused fund. 
Absolutely, um, and, and, and that's an existential, as I said, an existential imperative for, for the seniors. They're going to need the juniors to be successful again, uh, to replace what they're depleting. Um, the, the seniors have always been very capable brownfield explorers, but if you think about the mindset for a junior versus the mindset for a senior established company, uh, juniors are necessarily risk tolerant, necessarily entrepreneurial. They embrace risk. It's, it's very much a venture capital type of mindset. Whereas mm -hmm. within a mining company, what you're trying to do is largely mitigate risk, not embrace it. You know, mitigate risk, and, uh, mitigate risk in development, mitigate risk operationally, safety-wise. It's all about minimizing risk within your operating portfolio. So you can understand why juniors don't transition well to becoming developers and why uh, mining companies generally are not good grassroots explorers. So have you found it difficult to make this transition at all coming from a, you know, a senior management, you know, producing minor background? Are you waking up at night in cold sweats with the, the risk profile of these companies? <laughs> well, well, what, what you realize is that, um, you know, you're not dealing with deep management teams for the most part and they need help. Um, and and mm -hmm. um, in Mar Mark Prefontaine, I have an extremely capable geologist with great pedigree on the prospecting side, having successfully founded two uh, companies that went on to, to greater than over. Um, so he's a great doing, and he can provide us help. And again, having Zhao Jin behind us as well, if we need engineering help, Geolo more geological help beyond Mark, metallurgical help as we value the opportunities or if these juniors need that kind of technical expertise lent to them, we can provide it to them. Uh, um, and that's what the Zhao Jin brings to the table. So, so uh, yeah, it's different, but again, it was always a passion of mine. I've always been a big proponent of juniors. I've been involved in the development of 13 uh, mines in my career. Every single one of them came out of a junior, every single one. And if, if they did not do what they did, uh, we wouldn't have succeeded at Nico, at Hud Bay, or at Gold Corp. Okay. So a lot of the people that listen to this podcast, and, and myself included, you know, invest heavily in junior exploration companies. There's a passion for that amongst our listeners. But right now we're seeing a market where seniors, where royalty companies, where later stage development companies have been absolutely crushed. And there's a lot of people piling into these, myself included, seeing them as buying opportunities to get something at 30% off, 40% off. As, so I guess my question is, for those still interested in the junior space, is now, is now the time to deploy capital when you're seeing these companies that have just been absolutely hammered and are desperate for cash flow? Or are you guys maybe sitting back and waiting and saying, look, we're going to need to wait till the market comes back a little bit and there's going to be support beyond us right now to help, to help these companies along. What's your, what's your strategy, I guess, for managing this very unusual time? Well, there's, there's an element of both. And what I mean by both, you know, you're making a macro call uh, that the cycle will start to turn for juniors, but also you're doing a bottom up analysis of the best opportunities out there. And, and it's a combination of the two. Um, you know, when I, when I, partnered up with Zhao Jin on this, I insisted on bringing Mark Prefontaine in because, yeah, I can structure deals and I can make this type of macro call. But what I don't have is that geological depth. And, and I needed that bottom-up analysis from somebody who has a methodology when he looks at these things um, and, and brings that discipline and rigor to eat, looking at each of the individual opportunities. Um, as for time, what the timing couldn't be better in terms of value out there as to when the cycle will turn. Your guess is as good as mine. Uh, all we're trying to do is do that bottom up analysis and invest in the best prospects that we, we judge uh, that are out there uh, and, and wait for that cycle to turn. It inevitably has to just because, you know, mining companies are a collection of finite life assets and they're becoming that much more finite. Okay. Now, my next question is, given what's going on in the world today, how happy are you that you are not managing a major mining company at the moment? <laughs> well, well I, I certainly empathize, um, and, yeah. and I still have a lot of friends um, at mine sites. And, um, and the preoccupation, I would imagine, um, in the executive suite right now is with the health of the 
employees, not just the safety, but the health. It, it's become yeah. that elemental. And so um, it, it, it's become that much more human. Uh, the human dimension is is really paramount. Um, it's the only thing that you can focus on. Obviously, there are things that you need to do to put these assets on care and maintenance so that you can ramp back up as, as safely and quickly as possible uh, when the tide turns uh, on this pandemic. Uh, but you have to focus uh, uh, almost entirely on the, uh, the individual health of your employees. You know, unlike many, uh, many of the guests we've had on here who are professional investors, who are explorers, you know, you've actually been involved behind the scenes in making these decisions for large scale companies. What do you reckon people are thinking right now, you know, in the C-suites of the majors on terms of, of mine shutdown? Do you think we're going to be seeing a lot of mines being put on care and maintenance and people saying, hold on, let's wait and see? Or do you think companies will be doing their best to carry on business as usual as far as possible with the proper health and safety procedures in place? Do you have a, have a feel for that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, objectively and quantitatively, that's not happening. Um, there's north of 200 mines that have been shut down globally. Yep. TD has been putting out this list every week. Um, and so it, it's becoming very, very difficult for operations to be sustained and supply chains to be maintained. Never mind what's happening at the site, but a lot of the suppliers are, are not in a position to be able to deliver uh, the the elements that that the mine sites need to continue operation. But um, having been to many uh, operational settings, it's very, very difficult to have that kind of physical distancing within your operations uh, that our, our health authorities are demanding of us right now. And, uh, and so I think many mining companies are quite rightfully uh, winding down their operations, putting them on care and maintenance and hunkering down like we all are at home right now. You know, I hadn't really thought about this until you we were talking about this, but do you think there's any chance that this could spur another round of M&A in the gold space, in the major space, when some of the companies that are cashed up in a stronger position to just sit it out and wait are going to maybe be a bit uh, <laughs> more ruthless with some of their less prepared competitors? Well, well, when you're not having to deal with the day-to-day -day stress of operations, you know, notwithstanding the fact that care maintenance is not uh, not a simple process. Uh, getting to that stage is not a simple process. There's a lot of moving parts to get there. When you're not dealing with the day-to-day -day headaches of your operation, you're probably going to sit back and think a little bit more strategically if you're in the C-suite or at the board level. And so I would not be surprised um, if, if there were more conversations going on right now uh, than there otherwise would be when everybody's dealing with whether they're going to meet their quarterly numbers or not. All right. Uh, you know, just to wrap things up, you know, we, I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of weeks thinking about what the world's going to look like on the other side of this. And I think everyone I've talked to, they think it's going to be a different place, although not everyone, no, no one really knows for sure what that might be. Do you have any feel for, will there be any lasting impacts on the mining industry? Do you think mining looks like a different industry at all after this, or is it going to be quickly back to business as usual? And, oh. and understand, I don't have an answer for that, but I, I do wonder. I think it'll be the same but different. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, is uh, the more immediate priority uh, once we get the all clear from our health authorities is as quickly as possible start restart operations uh, for a variety of economic and social issues. You want to get those operations back up and running as quickly as possible. But what what this phenomenon has probably accelerated is is uh, some of the technologies that we've probably been adopting. Uh, more slowly in the mining business than we could otherwise do so. And, you know, I'm talking about uh, working remotely. Um, and, and I know at Gold Corp, when, when I was running it, we were doing, we were experimenting with um, tele-remote mining um, from, mm -hmm. from far distances. And, and maybe that'll hasten the adoption of that type of technology uh, you know, in terms of autonomous and semi-autonomous equipment usage in order to reduce the labor intensity at the mine sites and, and uh, reduce the risk that is inherent in fly-in, fly-out situations. Um, there's, that's a big part of the cost structure, but it's also a big part of the risk inherent um, with these pandemic issues is you're putting people in, in very tight uh, quarters uh, for a period of time, and, and that can um, hasten um, you know, virus spread. Okay. And any parting thoughts on on what you're thinking about or maybe what you think investors at home should be thinking about uh, either whilst or before deploying capital into the mining sector again? Well, well you know, I think um, 
what this has made very, very clear is that um, quantitative easing isn't going anywhere anytime soon. It's, it's here to stay. Um, and this was just um, a catalyst uh, for accelerating that quantitative easing. So uh, gold as an asset class has is, is never been more attractive in, in my career. I've been in the business 30 years. Uh, we've never seen uh, the expansion of money supply to the degree we're seeing it now. Interest rates on nominal real basis at levels that are unprecedented. Uh, this is hugely bullish for, for gold, but as an industry, uh, we're uh, less equipped to provide that leverage proposition because reserves are depleting and have been depleting for a number of years. We've done a great job in stabilizing our cost structure. So unlike coming out of the, the great financial uh, crisis of about a decade ago, I don't think we're going to see rapid cost inflation anymore because 10 years ago when gold was running, so were base metals. And so there was this competition to build capacity in both base and precious, which drove up cost structures dramatically. That's mm -hmm. not there anymore. Base is not participating because of the, the weak macroeconomic environment we find ourselves in. So I, I'd say it's never been better to be in gold as an asset class, never been better to be in gold equities. I think gold companies are going to be hugely profitable coming out of this because the cost structure is going to be quite stable, but the missing element is reserves in the ground. And that's why I'm making this call on the junior space. I believe that they're going to see some sunshine. How big of a concern do you think this lack of supply of new promising projects is for the guys and, the, and ladies running these major companies? Is this something that's, con are they scared right now? What is, what is the feel there? It's a constant preoccupation. It is for both board and management teams um, is, is replacing that reserve uh, profile and replacing that production pipeline. And, and now with the mega mergers that have occurred, those pipelines, uh, production platforms are that much bigger. Um, you've got to imagine that a Newmont and a, and, a, and a Barrick these days basically has to find a 10 million ounce deposit every year to replace what they're depleting, yeah. each of them. That's a tall order. And given the lack of prospecting occurring at the low end of the spectrum in the early stage exploration, that's, that's a significant concern for the industry over the ensuing four, five or six years. So the junior space has been lamenting about the lack of capital for exploration for the last decade, at least. Do you think we're going to see the majors doing more strategic investments in juniors and picking up the the slack that has been kind of dropped off by the traditional capital markets, I think, and the move to passive investing and all these things that have happened to make capital so scarce for junior companies. You know, you know, and they have been doing that selectively, both Barrick, Newmont, and some of the other smaller companies. And Nico for many, many years has been doing that. They've been supporting the junior space quite consistently um, and, and in some cases selectively. So I think they're doing that. Uh, could they do more? For sure, but I also think the, the traditional capital markets are going to pick up for, for the juniors because, um, you know, right now, the general up to this point, until recently, generals have not participated in the gold equities. It's really been the specialists have been buying these established mm -hmm. producers. And in past cycles, what happens is the generals come in, displace the specialists from the big cap names, and they go down a tier or two into the juniors. And that's when the juniors start to participate. It always happens in a lag, but this lag has been longer. Well, given the volatility in the general equity markets, I think if it's not a white flag, it's certainly a yellow flag is going up from the generals. And they're starting to look at gold equities as a viable investment alternative to, to other sectors um, in the general equity markets. And that, that will be a precursor uh, to, again, capital coming down to that junior tier. That's really what's going to drive the capital down is when the generals start to meaningfully participate in gold equities. And we start to see that weighting of gold equities as a part of the overall global indices start to become more meaningful. All right. Well, thank you very much, David. And thank you very much to everybody listening at home. That was David Garlafalo, currently the chairman and chief executive officer of Marshall Precious Metals Fund. If you liked this video, if you got any value out of it, please like it, please subscribe to our channel, and that'll just help us get to as many people as possible. David, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day and, and having a chat. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for having me on. Bye for now. <laughs>